Your eyes. They're one of my favorite things about you. When I was growing up, I was a PlayStation kitty, so I had much more exposure to the Metal Gear series than I had the Fallout series. Hearing Old Snake utter the words, War has changed, sent shivers down my back in such a way that I feared I'd shattered my spine. Imagine my surprise when Fallout Guy said War never changes. The opposite claim to Metal Gears. Personally, I believe Todd Howard and Hideo Kojima need to settle this in a fight to the death in the arena. But this clash of philosophies got me thinking, what would be the perfect build to prove that War has indeed changed? If nothing else, the Fallout series has a way of gripping you, much like a big Big scary man by your neck, probably. A captivating universe that diverges from ours at the point of the Second World War and progresses differently into the future. A future that looks like how the Jetsons taught our boomer parents it would look, because they were born too early to watch superior millennial alternatives such as Cory in the House or Jimmy Neutron. But there's one thing our parents learned with us. Huge explosions is cool. With this build, we'll not be using conventional arms, no boomsticks, no melee weapons. This is all about exerting our superiority, showing those wastelanders that we, Flobin Dorperman, sweat growth hormone and consume only raw egg whites, settling our differences only with explosions and our God-given fists. I craft the perfect husband for Nora, the perfect husband for the perfect build. The doorbell rings. It's probably a Mormon. I open the door, and then in a nefarious display of masculinity, I ignore him to sit down on the couch. Nora loves unnecessary displays of aggression. Prologue Salesman signs us up for an insurance package that allows us into Vault 111 in the case of total nuclear annihilation. But the likelihood that that's gonna happen is pretty slim, right? Go away. <laughs> Honey, look, it's total nuclear annihilation on the TV. Good thing we signed up for that doomsday vault like a couple minutes ago. I always loved the prologues in Fallout games because they're kind of like a looking glass into the human soul. For example, would it be human nature to bravely escort your wife and child to the vault? Or is it perhaps more realistic to book it out of there, leaving them behind? You may not like it, but this is what peak performance looks like. We make it to the vault and the prologue ends. Nora exclaims that this is our new home, and then the bigwigs cryogenically freeze Florbin Bean in an effort to preserve the perfect human. But Things happen and we wake up from freezing hundreds of years later. Wife dead and baby gone. No money, more problems. Flauber pretends this upsets him, but alas, any care in the world is a facade. We settle our difference with these mutated roaches with a bit of us us. One of two methods of dealing death with this build. Because there's no better way to show our enemy that war's changed than by charging in like a gorilla. Gorilla warfare. We patiently await the opening of the vault door. The outside revealing to us the post-apocalyptic playground for the Reaper's chosen horsemen. The first thing we want to do is put our points into strength, perception, endurance, career charisma, and agility. Mostly for a good reason, but also because intelligence and luck are for nerds. We'll be putting our talent points into Iron Fist, which increases our punching attack damage by 20%, and then some at higher levels. Demolition Expert, level 1 and 2 for reasons soon to be explained, and Local Leader to enable us to set up supply lines between settlements. But we don't have any settlements yet, so we travel to Concord nearby. To get our first settlement, we need to shackle our new labor force. I mean, we need to rescue some townsfolk. To do that, we have to show these bandits that war has changed using our dad rage. Needless to say, our fighting is superior. And we clear them out of the streets and also the History Museum where our new friend Preston Garvey is held up. We set the mood and tempo of our conversation by first giving him a right hook and running away. The punch and running away prepares the people for the pain and the abandonment they are soon to find so commonplace in our future settlement. But running away is also because Preston Garvey will be expecting us to fight a death claw. And death claws are totally not cool. Probably not all that punchable as we currently are. So we will have to deploy the second facet of our build. Fragmentation Mines. Frag Mines break up the absurdity of showing people these hands with spells of explosive stoicism. Amazing. We have to sell all the junk we picked up from the bandits we beat to death in Concord, and also at this bus stop, to the traders at Bunker Hill. But first we'll have to introduce ourselves to the local town guards. Caravan or Raider? What? I said Caravan or Raider. Okay, just play it cool. Raider! <laughs> we sell some stuff and get a good deal from the vendors by a Bethesda rotating mid-conversation. Buy some mines and then scoot on out to farm up some more. Because we're poor, most of our mines are found by way of scavenging. Quite unbecoming of Flop and Blobbin, but this is only temporary for now. Mines are found around various super mutant and bandit camps near the Boston airport and surrounding areas. Finding the mines isn't so much the issue as remaining concealed as. With short spells of outsmarting the local wildlife and dangerous enemies in the area with our single point in intellect, it's all about quality, not quantity. With our dozen or so mines, we return to Concord to help out Preston and the gang with the death claw. You may not like him, but when he's done counting from 20 to 5 and gives you this look right here, you just know he and his group absolutely have to become your forced labor crew. I mean, your first settlement townsfolk. My favorite character in the whole game is Mama Murphy. This woman is a chem addict and claims it gives her magical powers and looks at you like you are the second coming of Walter White. <laughs> Great. You're completely nuts. <laughs>
Anyway, we climb into the power armor to continue the quest, jump down, turn a bandit's head into a soup, and in an egregious display of manhood, place these mines out in the open while the Deathclaw tears through the remaining bandits ahead of us. Do you think this is enough explosives? War has changed. Now, some of you might say I should have used the minigun, but to you I say, Shut up. I didn't need much convincing, but Preston asks us to join him in Sanctuary to start a settlement. Mama Murphy wants some more chems. Preston doesn't like this. And now I'm resolved to do everything in my power to bring them to her. Anyways, the reason we want a settlement is twofold. Money generation to be able to buy materials, and a chem station to be able to craft mines from these materials. Maintaining relationships with your settlers is vital for growing your settlement population. I used to be quite the adventurer when I was younger. Now, these old bones just can't keep up. The more people coming to your settlements, the more potential for profit there is. And for the time being, we still need to get to level 10 to learn a demolition expert level 2 trait. So I work on some small jobs around the settlement to bring everything up to scratch. Only barely though, because this will not be the settlements I focus on in the long run. I provide them with water, food, beds, and provide Mama Murphy with these hands. This kind of breaks her, but some jet later on will fix her, so, so it's okay. I indulge Preston for the sweet, sweet allure of additional XP, and he asks us to help another settlement with their raider problems. I equip all the crummy gear I'd picked up from the raiders whose heads I'd exploded with my punches, and sneak into Corvega plant, unfortunately in short supply of frag mines, so relying on my fist for lengthy portions of this job. My objective is to beat up this guy called Jared, who uses me as a bullet sponge while I do him the tombstone stunner in between bouts of consuming various chems, and injecting blood pack IVs to ensure I do not die from blood loss through my 85 bullet holes. Fortunately for me, we are creating the perfect build, so these bullet holes just allow for better airflow into my lungs. With our mission a success, we return to camp and give Mama Murphy the jet we found in the Raiders. She trips massive balls, and we show her these hands for all time's sake. We gobble up some XP for the job well done, then recognizing that Floorpeen Dorpeen is an unstoppable juggernaut of industry he makes us the governor of the settlement. Much to our jubilation. I now get to tell the people what to do. And if they don't like it, I show them the light. What gave you the idea we're friends? I'd like to trade some items. This is government done correctly. But we still need to get to level 10 to see this build to its full potential. So I go on a series of plunderous escapades across the commonwealth, steadily gaining XP, and also materials for when our settlement gets set up. I know it sounds like I'm holding out on you with the deets, and that's because I am. I've got something special planned for you. So for now, let me show you how I blew up this raider so hard that it reduced the game's frame rate to 0.2 of a frame per second. And then how I used my overwhelming brawn to send this guy through a wormhole to another dimension. I like to think he lives a whole other life. He's in a strange land for years, but learns to forget the past, learns to forget the subway he was hiding in. He gets a job, gets married, has kids. Persephone and Carl are good kids. Every Sunday morning, he does the gardening while his wife cooks him breakfast. When he opens the front door, his dog excitedly rushes to pick up the newspaper. But then one day he blips back into reality and gets stunlock powerbombed to death. Fortunately, clearing out some of these bandit hideouts nets us some more mines, which we then save up by dealing with the rest of them by means of unadulterated violence. The amount of violence you will need to make this build work is yes. I go to Diamond City, not to inquire about my missing son. By now, I had forgotten about him anyway. I'm here to sell everything I have to purchase materials and more frag mines. Unfortunately, in the process, I end up selling my road leathers, which means my gear with the highest armor rating is now a man in a diaper with only peripheral gear equipped. And I still need to get to level 10, so I go on a series of quests to get the XP required. Finally, some good news for a change. I can now craft frag mines at a chem station, but because we can't make a chem station until level 14, we will be using the one that's already in place at Red Rocket. But Red Rocket is empty and none of our material stash is there, so we need to set up a supply line to Red Rocket using our local leader perk to allow us to access these materials to craft at the chem station. Initially, I was going to get Mama Murphy to run the supply line, but she isn't able to take on this work for some reason. Taking too much to talk too long. I should sit down. 
The game lets me do this because Todd Howard advocates for violence. This is what it was all for. Though this place looks like a dump now, we'll be turning this into a money-making fortress. The problem with using mines as your only munition is that they're relatively hard to come by, and the materials to make them are really expensive. And I don't like doing any work, so I will establish a colony to do it for me. A shack for each of the workers. I consider giving them proper living quarters, but at the last moment I changed my mind and settled for giving them just sleeping bags on the floor. Windmills for power to offset my oppressive regime by pretending to care about the environment. Water pumps for resources. Guard towers to lull the people into a false sense of security. And of course, a system of government such as this is not complete unless I am able to look down on them while dressed in my luxurious aqua bathrobe and build a needlessly decadent large metal home above the settlers within eyeshot, complete with a totally unnecessary yet lavish disco ball, working power and ceiling fans, a bed off the floor, and a picture of, I don't know, this guy. Such luxury. And right now you're asking, what will your empire of five whole people be working on, best guest? Well, I'll show you. It's a mutt fruit plantation. You see, in Diamond City there's a mutt fruit farm, which you can pick from freely, and then plant at your own settlement to grow them. And as your ones bear fruit and your settlers work the fields, you'll replant those, which ends up becoming an exponentially expanding industry. And why mutt fruit? Well, one of the most profitable farms you'll hear talked about online is purified water, which has a value of 20 caps per piece, whereas mutt fruit only has a value of 8 caps. The difference here for me is weight. Purified water comes in at 0.5, with mutt fruit at 0.1. This means, hypothetically, if you were to end up with 500 142 mutt fruit. These would weigh in at 55 pounds, rounded up at a value of 4,336 caps. Whereas the same weight of purified water would only value at 2,200 caps. You could argue it's quicker to farm purified water, but to those of you who do, I would pose the following question. Is it not cooler to sit on your rooftop lawn chair watching your 11 settlers work the fields? In your kingdom of rusty metal shacks? I'll answer for you. No. No wait, yes. Also, I spend a massive amount of time AFK, and when I am present, I spend it waiting to exploit this farm's output. Every day I check the stash. I walk around my plantation in my aqua blue bathrobes. I ring this bell and make sure all of my settlers are assigned to working the fields. I bamboozle some ghouls at the graveyard with my mass-produced fragmentation mines. And there's one thing we can yet retrieve to make this build even better. We take our mines to Swan's Pond, place an absurd amount of mines, dish them out like they're thong dollars. Sometimes this happens. Let me try again. Place an absurd amount of mines. Rouse Swan, the monstrosity in the middle of the lake, and watch on as he gets sent down to Pop Rock Town. A masterful display. He drops the Furious Power Fist, which is our insurance policy against accidentally running out of mines. But also on its own, it's an OP weapon. The most powerful fist weapon in the game. If you're not convinced that this build is proof that war has changed, allow me to show you a few examples. In a normal war zone, you'd shoot this mutt. However, I lay my mines. But the enemy mongrel is not following me, so I punch this car to make a noise. However, this results in my game going back down to one frame per second. So, so maybe another example. You can plan for an ambush by laying mines where you enter a sussy part of the map. If war hadn't changed, you'd shoot this gang of raiders. But in a situation where you're surrounded, our helpless yet amazingly sexual governor will stand in this corner. Now that's tactics. They don't teach you the strategy in military academy. And when Todd spawns some rando mole rats behind you, they also end up being handled by the mines we placed. Sending a spray of blood and guts everywhere. That's majestic. But it's not just ambushes where this build works wonders. When we're not too busy allowing ourselves to be an absolute mega mind, enjoying the scent of sulfur and blood mist in the air, we're enjoying the finer things in life. Like watching Magnolia in the bar in Good Neighbor, without so much as a single thought about how our wife was killed maybe one in-game week ago. Anyway, the reason we're here is to take a mission from the mayor, one where our build will excel by means of stealth. He sends us to the Pikmin Gallery, where all of his previous scouts had ended up dead or missing. The raiders outside are my favorite. They think they have the drop on me, but I'm standing here extremely. Some even watch me place the mines in front of them and then walk on them anyway. They really gotta get off the jet. Imagine how demoralizing must feel to see your friends drop one by one at the mercy of a blue bathrobe man. Floppine Dorp kills them, Floppine dead with a smile on his face. Immediately in the entrance of the Pikmin Gallery, there are two raiders in deep conversation, and these guys could be here forever. So instead of planting a mine and waiting for them to walk over it, I simply throw one over their heads, which immediately explodes. Then sneak back downstairs, full PG-13, with my sultry legs on display. Despite the explosion in this confined space, and the screams of death and spray of blood guts, there's a guy who concludes it must have been the wind. I find him, for some reason, kicking this door, and desperately try to get his attention so he'll step backwards onto a mine I've planted. But he just won't do it, so I end up having to punch him in the ass. Clearing the rest of this place out, totally undiscovered, is no problem. And we do this with a smile on our face. Florba loves destruction. There's a mutated mongrel. A raider with a massive brain. 
And a wall lady. A raid is so powerful that she defeats my mind laying strategy by simply looking at this wall. I have lost. Anyway, I punch her in the neck and finish the quest. But there must be something out there. A being so powerful that they can put up at least a little bit of a fight against Governor Snorbenblorben. Well, there is. But it requires a handful of quests to get to him. Edward Deegan offers us a job to work for one of the more mysterious and wealthy families in the Commonwealth. Obviously, I accept this illustrious opportunity and head over to the Cabot House where I'm told to meet them. They have some pretty decked out security bots outside, but I don't like this. I am the security now. I'm the security now. <laughs> We meet Jack Cabot who wants to talk to us about hit history channel show, Ancient Aliens. But I tell him to shove it up his ass. He wants me to go to Parsons Asylum to recover a serum that's gone missing. But I first sneak up the stairs and steal the Zeta gun that he's left out on the table. I head on over to Parsons. This blockhead tells me some raiders took the serum and where to find them. But also talks to me like I'm a grunt. So I sweep her legs in a show of overwhelming masculinity. I already told you where the... The raiders are all hunkered down in this warehouse, but our build is too powerful and our strategy is simple, to booby trap all the entryways. And when some of them do manage to get out, you just run around the warehouse in circles, leaving them some gifts behind. It works 100% of the time, almost all of the time. I retrieve the serum and return to the cabot house and tell them about the raiders. I also lie and tell them the serum wasn't there when I cleared the place out. I then inject the serum into myself in front of them to no reaction whatsoever. Perhaps like most people, they too are intimidated by alpha giga chads such as Plorp and Blorb. The next job that needs to be done is to find Jack Cabot's flighty young sister, Emma Jean. I can find out where she is by speaking to Magnolia in the shady bar under Good Neighbor. As thanks for her help, I give her the Mama Murphy special to the surprise of absolutely no one else in the bar. Even the bouncer, to whom I show my gratitude before leaving. Emma Jean is with a fellow called Brother Thomas at this dome place right here. The story behind this place is that they claim to be part of some newly formed religion, but I know their secret. They're a cult, and they're being cagey about Emma Jean's whereabouts. You can find Emma Jean locked up in Brother Thomas's office around back. All of a sudden, she comes to the realization that Flop Man is the golden god. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't have any other explanation for this facial expression, so that's, that's, that's what I'm going with. Anyway, there's a few interesting ways this quest can go. I imagine most people find Brother Thomas and either pass a persuasion check to get Emma Jean released, or kill him to take his office key. Flauber, however, agrees to join the cult, but not quite, you see. Brother Thomas leads you to his office where he'll try to convince you that to join the religion, you have to give up all of your earthly possessions. I, however, already left him to two to three of my possessions on the floor in there. <laughs> this is the best playstyle. I return to find Jack speaking to Edward over the radio, and I immediately run up the stairs to steal the Zeta gun he left laying out on his table again. It seems Edward is pinned down in gunfire somewhere in Parsons Asylum, although Jack seems kind of happy about it. His mum Wilhelmina, however, is behaving irate and needs to calm down. The thing about this build is you have to balance two sides of the same coin. On one side, stoicism, patience, laying booby traps. The other side is brawn, man sweat, distilled manliness. Anyway, Jack agrees to meet me in Parsons so we can put an end to the raiders meddling in their affairs once and for all. In there's also our goal. And when he's gone, Wilhelmina keeps speaking to me like I'm a butler. I don't need anything right now, thank you. I don't need anything right now, thank you. I don't need anything right now, thank you. Hi, Mrs. Cabot. What do you want? Hey. What do you want? I don't need anything right now, thank you. Jack hired me for one reason and one reason only. To fight his battles like an ascended warrior. And as we continue, my otherworldly powers flourish. And Flauber not only sets the minds, he becomes the minds. Every confrontation in this asylum is met with the stoicism only history's greatest silent monks could offer. Packaged within a man who bathes in the light of a disco ball every morning. But minds aren't always a perfect system. Sometimes Todd programs them to explode and do no damage. At which point we must rely on our perfect body to land the killing blows. Jack and I might not be of one mind. Showcased by how he wanders into rooms full of enemies and immediately gets riddled with bullets. However, we require only one mind. Only one point in intelligence. Observe. A raider behind this wall. But walls pose no barrier for my single point in intellect. When you have only one intelligence, it's a case of quality over quantity. In the last chamber of the asylum, we see our adversary, the final boss of this build. A man with an ancient artifact grafted onto his nervous system, granting him psychokinetic powers and immortality. A man who had been locked up for 400 years, whose blood provides the cabots with a serum that also grants eternal life. I easily dispatch the remaining raiders trying to release him. Their earthly shells are nothing but red sludge to my superior minds. Their 
leader, a guy called Lefty, now no longer has use of his left leg. Be touched by the hand of God, my child. My battle is not with you. This is where my moral compass gets exposed for all to see. You see, Jack wants me to flood the chamber with radiation to kill him. And Lorenzo wants me to free him so we can kill the Cabot family. I simply wish to prove that war has changed. To defeat the ultimate adversary. So I release him. And he agrees to meet me at the Cabot house so that we can team up against the Cabot family. But I have other ideas. My return to the Cabot house is understandably met with some ire. You see, Jack claims Lorenzo will be there at any moment to kill them. But because cutscenes are hard for Bethesda, he's actually just standing up in his office until his scripted time to emerge. The ultimate battle is about to commence. I have to side with either Cabot House or Lorenzo, but both sides disgust me. Fortunately, Jack does nothing to stop me wandering around his house until I speak with him, and Lorenzo will simply stand there until Jack utters the words, we're not done here, which is when he steps forward, and when he does, we're not done here. You have to understand, Lorenzo is no pushover. This man survived bottle cap mines, several frag mines, the combined damage output is something like this, and it barely did a dent in his health bar. To defeat this man, I'll be doing every chem I saved up for Mama Murphy, and also drink these two Nuka Colas. Delicious Nuka Cola goodness. And go ham on him. Drugs are bad for you kids, don't do them. And there you have it. The ultimate build for the ultimate occasion. The apocalypse perfected. Swan was a pushover. Lorenzo empowered by ancient magical technologies was a pushover. And what next? Well, for now, we spend our days watching over the mutt fruit farm until such a time as I, I guess, remember my son was the thing I was, I was looking for. <laughs> until then, honeys, be kind to each other, see the description in the socials, and a big thank you to my patrons. I hope to see you there at the next video. Until next time. Ah, speak. What's up?